Hello, this is Julian and Willy. We are from Datakin. Today, we're going to talk about data lineage with Apache Airflow using Open Lineage. Um, so we talk about Open Lineage, Marquez, and let's end with a demo. <clears throat> so to start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem um, and um, how to address uh, lineage and why it's important. Um, after that, we'll talk about Open Lineage, which is an open standard for lineage collection. And then we will we'll introduce Marquez, its reference implementation. And we'll end with a demo of um, how to use Open Lineage and Marquez with Airflow uh, to achieve observability. So first, I'll start with talking about uh, the need for the lineage metadata. <clears throat> and this is how we understand data, where data is coming from. So to build a healthy data ecosystem, um, you need to understand dependencies between teams. Usually within a given team, whether it's a team of data engineers, of analysts, of uh, machine learning engineers, uh, there's a very good understanding of what the stack is, or what the dependencies are within the team. Uh, and typically the friction starts from inter-team dependency. Um, so if you've heard of the concept of data mesh or of various uh, agile methodologies um, to be able to move fast uh, and implement metrics in different areas of an organization, um, you usually have multiple teams and often every team in the company in some way consumes or produces data. And that creates a lot of dependencies. So that's where you need tooling to start understanding better how those teams depend on each other and um, avoid the kind of friction where uh, someone makes a change and uh, doesn't understand the impact downstream of what the change is doing. And they might be breaking something or they might be preventing from changing things because they don't know what the impact is going to be and they want to avoid breaking things. And similarly, on the other hand, people might know what data they're reading and what they're using, but they may not know how it's produced and where it's coming from. And so the first goal of um, understanding data lineage uh, is to build a healthy data ecosystems where you understand dependencies. So today, often people are in a limited context. Um, it's often unclear what is the data source or what is the schema, what the schema is supposed to be uh, for something or some of the semantics around the schema. Um, who owns a data set and how it's updated and how often, uh, where it's coming from, what are the actual original um, source data sets that are leveraged to produce this derived one. And, and Conversely, it's also difficult when you produce data to know who is using it um, and, um, and what is impacted downstream when you want to change that. Um, it's also um, often complicated to understand what has changed uh, when you're trying to investigate a problem with your data, right? Has it always looked like this or has it changed recently? So all those kind of questions are difficult to answer when all you have is the knowledge of the data set you produce or the data set you consume, but you don't have visibility beyond that. And that's where data lineage is really important. And so often um, I've been using this um, parallel with the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. And the Maslow's hierarchy of needs talk about how you reach happiness, right? And what are the steps to want this? And before you um, want to reach for happiness, right? Like there are some basic needs that needs to be fulfilled, like um, having food and shelter. And once you have that, um, being safe and being in a safe environment. And then you build on top of those basic needs, one after the other, and then you can reach that step when you can look for happiness, self-realization, and re, you know, like getting the, to the best version of yourself you can be. And so in the data world, there's a very strong parallel here. Like before you can get any value out of your data, you first, it first needs to be available, right? That's the first basic need. You need some way 
to access that data and, uh, and leverage it. And second, once you have this data available, it needs to be fresh, right? Like you can't just have like an old uh, export or something. It needs to be maintained. And when you have like several level of transformation, it needs to be maintained and transform in a timely manner. And so once your data is available and it's a bit in a timely manner, then it also needs to be correct. And that's where data quality comes into play. And once you have those things like data being available, the being fresh and being correct, then you can start uh, using it to first do things like optimize your business, um, measure things, uh, understand and optimize what you're seeing, and next find new opportunities um, based on your data. So it's kind of the equivalent of the data hierarchy of needs. How do you become the best version um, that you can be leveraging that data? And so what we're going to focus on in this presentation is really making sure the basic needs are covered, right? How do you understand data availability, data freshness, data quality? How do you monitor it? How do you understand the dependencies between your data set? And now it's changing something on one end of this lineage graph, impact things downstream. And so that's where um, we introduced Open Lineage last year. Um, and Open Lineage is a project that is focused on capturing these dependencies and understanding how data is being transformed and produced across an entire ecosystem. Um, and so to start this project, we reach out to uh, many people, many contributors to the data ecosystem um, to discuss how we needed a standard to collect lineage across the entire data ecosystem. And so we reach out um, to a lot of people either in the data transformation system, like things like Pandas or Spark or DBT and like uh, Parquet, and like, which is really about how do we transform the data, whether it's like SQL or more um, code oriented frameworks like Spark or Pandas and really all the parts about transformations. Uh, we reach out to also to projects who care about um, collecting lineage and showing in one place, whether it's for governance or operation or discovery, like Marquez did have a Munson. Um, and we also reach out to projects who care about, um, you know, scheduling or data quality, like great expectation. So getting, um, reaching out uh, to a lot of people to bootstrap this effort. And of course, 90% agreed that yes, we do need a um, standard for lineage collection and it's long due and instead of reinventing the wheel and having many different ways to collect data, um, this metadata, we should all get together and build something. And how come there's not something on it? And well, the reason is in fact, nobody get starting this effort of getting together and doing it, then it's not going to happen. So here we are, um, and that's how we bootstrapped the Open Lineage project last year. And, um, and building with the purpose of defining an open standard for collection of lineage metadata from pipelines as they are running, right? And in that sense, it's very similar, and there's a clear parallel between Open Lineage and Open Telemetry. Right. If you're familiar with Open Telemetry, is this project that standardizes how you collect traces and metrics from services, which is very similar to how you collect lineage and data quality metrics, for example, from data pipelines. So there's this clear parallel of defining this open standard. And Open Telemetry is in the CNCF, uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, where Kubernetes is and all the service ecosystem is. And Open Lineage is part of the LFAI and data, the sister foundation to the CNCF about data pipeline, machine learning, and all those aspects. So it's kind of like a clear parallel in the ecosystem. And so really, if we simplify this purpose, right, of collecting lineage, uh, metadata from pipeline as they're running, it's very similar to being the EXIF for data pipeline. So EXIF is a standard that defines how to collect metadata 
for your picture. So if you're taking a picture with your digital camera or your smartphone, it's going to collect information that the, like the time it was taken at, uh, where it was taken, so GPS coordinates and a lot of other information uh, right as the picture is taken. And right, the, the best time to collect this metadata is when the thing is happening. So Open Image is similarly collecting metadata on the jobs as they're running so that you can have very precise uh, information about lineage and all the other related metadata about how data was produced. And so before Open Lineage, right, if we go back to this ecosystem and we're looking at analysis tools, scheduler, SQL warehouses, uh, SQL engines, all those things that might produce lineage information. And then you have a bunch of projects. And I took a, a subset of like the open source uh, ecosystem here with Amundsen, Data Hub, Marquez, Egeria, world care of collecting lineage. You have a lot of complexity that comes from being able, everybody is like duplicating the same effort of how do we understand the internal of each of those systems so that we can extract the lineage information and all the metadata that we are interested in. And so there's lots of complexity, there's lots of duplication of effort. And since all those integration are looking from the outside, every time one of those things changes, then it breaks integration and then you have to deal with all the various versions of those projects. And so with Open Lineage, it's really simplify the problem. So first, it's a way to mutualize the effort. Like if we agree on a standard, now we can all use this standard edge lineage collection and we don't have to reinvent the wheel and have like N square of communication to make everything work. Uh, and since Open Lineage is a spec and it defines how you expose lineage, you can start pushing the dependencies on open lineage in each of the projects. So instead of having to deal with each and every version of Spark or each and every version of a SQL warehouse and all of those things, you can start like pushing the dependency into each of them. And like each project can expose lineage in a standard way. And now there's no more complexity ar around supporting many versions of something or being broken because now each project can depend on this standardized API and it simplify the problem a lot for everyone. So it's really this notion of simplifying uh, the problem. And so if we look at the architecture, you have the producers, right? There can be Pandas, Spark, DBT, Airflow Prefect, or like proprietary uh, SQL warehouses, for example. There's this metadata and lineage collection standard defined by Open Lineage. And then you can have different backends for collecting this information, right? Like Open Lineage is focusing on how we standardize our presentation and how we collect lineage from each of the system so that it can be consumed by different uh, system independent, right? And later in this presentation, Willie will go on um, explaining more how Marcus works and how it's collecting this information. So you can have multiple backend and again, it's very uh, similar to the way open telemetry works, which can have multiple backend to collect lineage and traces to different systems. And because if they all depend on lineage in this as a certain way, uh, and they all depend on the same lineage collection, the way they expose it, like whether it's Amundsen or Data Hub or Marcus and Nigeria, they focus on very different use cases and they're going to leverage this data, index it, like present it in a different way. And so if I dive a little bit more in the data model, uh, Open Lineage is core about like three main entities. There's this notion of data set, a job, and runs. So a job consumes and produces data set and run in a certain instance of a given job running. So we are making observation about a given run of a job consuming and producing certain data set. And this is all defined in the JSON schema spec. So there's this core model, uh, which is very simple of knowing that there's a run that has a unique ID um, that uh, is an instance of a job running and the job has a consistent name uh, that is a hierarchical name to make sure it is um, 
consistently we know it's the same in a different instance of the same job running every hour, every day, every week, or every month. And then data sets also are identified through a consistent naming policy that identifies um, that you're running this job might be reading every day the same data set and writing to the same data set and updating them every day. Right, so this is all defined in a JSON schema spec. And then there's this core lineage model. And then there's this notion of facet that lets you attach various species of beta data to each of those entities. And really um, enable collecting very precise metadata uh, around the notion of run, Java data set. And I'll go in the details of what that means. So the protocol is very simple, right? It's sending asynchronous events. Uh, a unique run ID helps correlating events for the same run. And really the backend is configurable. It could be an HTTP backend where we could just post those JSON events or a Kafka backend or anything else. Uh, this is configurable. So you can extend the model and add more backends if that's useful to you. And so as an example, you would start a run start event that would say which run is running um, and you would have information about what's the version of the source code, what were the run parameters that were passed. Uh, and when the run is complete, you may capture, oh, what was the input data set? What was the schema of the input data set? Uh, what's the output data set version? And what was the schema at the time it was written? So you can capture, you know, what exactly that job has done um, and what's the version of everything at this particular point in time. And so this model is very extensible. <clears throat> Those facets are atomic pieces of metadata identified by a unique name and that can be attached to those core open image entities, right? Which means as defining a spec instead of having a giant monolithic spec uh, that takes a long time to converge, we can have a lot of tiny specs, um, each of them being a facet and people who care about data quality can focus on how do we define data quality methods. And people who care about uh, column level lineage can define a facet of how we capture column level lineage or query performance and so on and so forth. It's also decentralized because there's a notion of core facets that are part of the spec and part of the open lineage repo, but it also enables anyone to define custom facets that they define themselves that don't need necessarily to be approved uh, by the open source, by the centralized project, and really enable, enables anyone to experiment and add other pieces of metadata that they define uh, to the model and capture this. And so this is very useful to enable other projects to define things from their particular viewpoint. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that over time, if we see like usage of certain custom facet being very popular, uh, you can promote them as core facet in the core spec. So to give you some examples of facets and to understand this concept better, at the data set level, we might have a facet which is uh, data quality statistics, right? Um, understand, hey, what's the distribution of each of the columns? How many nulls, how many rows, and so on. You might have the schema, uh, what was the version of the data set in the underlying storage as uh, identifiers for a specific version. So you know what version of the data set you read and what version of the data set you wrote. For example, if you're using Iceberg or Delta Lake, uh, you could you may collect column level lineage at the data set level. At the job level, you might collect what was the source code, right? If it's a SQL query, you can capture the SQL as metadata. Um, you could capture the dependencies, what the version of the libraries you're using. You can capture the version in source control, it could be a Git chart, could be a tag. You could capture the query plan of this particular uh, execution. At the run level, you might be interested in schedule time. If it's scheduled to run hourly, for example, what hour was it for? On top of the actual start time and the actual end time, it's important for measuring SLAs on things. Um, there may be some notion of batch IDs. You could capture the query profile and you could capture uh, the particular parameters for this given run. And there are lots of policy depend, <clears throat> sorry, there's a lot of possibilities um, in this world, right? You can use that for tr tracing dependencies, identify the root cause, to prioritize your issues based on like how many things are depending on a particular issue. Um, 
understanding your impact analysis uh, before you want to do a change, um, automating the backfields when something fails, you can identify all the things downstream that need to be rerun. Because the worst thing that can happen is not a job failing, because usually that blocks everything, right? And you just fix the jobs, then it runs again and everything propagates and works. The worst thing that it can happen is a job going through and producing bad data that propagates through everything. Because then you need to identify all the things downstream that have happened and rerun them in the right order, right? So that's kind of metadata that Open Lineage collects that enables you to do that. It enables to do anomaly detection um, and understand, you know, if you have a data quality issues in your dashboard, it's always, always come from some issue upstream. So being able to correlate downstream problem on your data quality with upstream changes uh, in your lineage is extremely important. It helps with change management, historical analysis, and complaints. Like for example, I want to know where my user private data is going downstream, like who's consuming it. Um, so all kind of use cases um, that are very exciting, right? So, and that's the value of Open Lineage as a core standard that we can get all together, um, have a one way to collect lineage, and then everybody can benefit and build all those use cases on top of that. And that's kind of, for example, at Datakin, we care a lot about data availability, um, timeliness, and quality of like making sure you can trust your data. And now I'm going to let uh, Willie talk about Marquez. Marquez is a reference implementation of Open Lineage um, that collect and uh, store uh, the metadata in centralized store. And um, here you go, Willie. Thanks, Julian. So for the second part of our talk, we'll be discussing Marquez. Um, Marquez is an open source metadata service. Now, full disclosure, before joining Datakin, I was on WeWork's data platform team where I co-created Marquez. Um, we maintain and develop the project for about two years before uh, donating the, the project to the LF, AI, and data. And as Julian mentioned, the Marquez project is a reference implementation of Open Lineage. So further along in, the, in my portion of the talk, you'll see that the core model of Marquez has some overlap with the core model of Open Lineage. Now the general architecture of Marquez, um, it's it's going to be broken up into two components. So you'll have a Rust API uh, that allows us to collect metadata around uh, jobs and data sets. So the back end is developed in Drop Wizard and in, in Java. And uh, on the back end, we, where we store our core meta, meta model, uh, we use Postgres. So the integrations themselves, they use clients uh, that wrap the Rust API. So we have one for Python and we have one for Java. Uh, so that allows you to collect metadata around ETL jobs, sort of what are what are the uh, data sets that are they're loading into a warehouse. And then similarly for batch and streaming applications, um, you can we you can collect metadata around the different data sets that are being processed and derived um, from data sets upstream. Now the centralized uh, meta model that's managed by Marquez consists of three entities. You're going to have sources, data sets, and jobs. So sources are going to be the physical location of your data sets. So one example is going to be uh, Postgres, MySQL, so your, your, your databases, and also warehouses like Redshift. And the data sets themselves are going to be the tables. So they're going to be the data points, or in, in this case, the rows that make up, make up your table. And for jobs, they're going to be the ones that are reading tables and writing to tables. So there, there needs to be code that moves data around or, or uh, takes input data sets and derives a, a different types of data sets. So that's where um, jobs come to play, or that's that's what jobs are. Now, there are three features of Marquez. I mean, there, there's a few others, but the three main main uh, components are going, are going to be data governance. So you're able to annotate the metadata that you collect for jobs and data sets with tags. Uh, so uh, you, could, you could add a PII tag to a data set, which could be a table. And that's going to that's going to in indicate that this table has personal identifiable information. Uh, so if you want to use it in your dashboard, or if you want to use it in your uh, ETL job, you may have to go through a certain process to gain access to that data. The data lineage component is probably the most interesting part about the model itself. So you can have all these jobs um, 
emitting metadata to Marquez via the REST API. And Marquez will actually stitch together the graph based off the inputs and output data sets of a job and give you a holistic view of all the jobs that are running and also all the, the different teams that uh, own those jobs. And then finally, with data discovery and exploration, really that's going to be in two forms. One is going to be through the lineage graph. So you'll be able to click through nodes, um, whether it's a job or data set, and see the metadata that's associated with, the, with those nodes. Or you could actually just search. So if you know the table that you want to use uh, for your ETL job or your, uh, your dashboard, you can use a search component uh, that we'll demo later on in my talk. So the, the jobs data set and source model is really where it overlaps with um, open lineage. Now where Marquez differs is really the version component. So as, it's, uh, as Marquez is accepting or really ingesting it, open lineage events, it will take the, in the, let's go and really just discuss the job entity. Um, it will take the job uh, metadata that it's received, apply versioning function on the metadata. So if any metadata has changed, in particular, whether the uh, location or the source code location has changed, um, or if the inputs and outputs have changed, you'll, uh, Marquez will uh, move this version pointer uh, to the new version that is now aware of. And then similarly for data sets, that one's a little bit more straightforward because it actually is based off the schema that it receives. So if you upload, or I'm sorry, if you um, post metadata around a data set and the schema has changed, uh, a new version will be created. So it's able to keep track of the different columns that are present at a given time. Uh, so if you ever want to go back, let's say a month or two months, you'll be able to know what the current, what the schema was uh, for that time period. Now, the other uh, interesting component is going to be the run. Uh, so the run itself is based off a job version. So when a, when, um, when a run, when run metadata is collected, it's actually based off the, the job uh, version. So if when a, when a run is instantiated, it's going to pull in what was the source code, what was the inputs and outputs. Uh, so that way, as a, as a job runs, it's emitting its run state metadata, its run args, uh, but also when it completes, that's when we also create a new data set version. So for a, for a data set version to be created, it's either going to be based off of a schema, the schema changes, or if a run completes, and the output data set um, uh, for that run um, was touched. So if, a, if, it, uh, if it fails, it's not going to create a version. But if it completes, we just assume on the back end that the run uh, modified that data set in some, in some way. Now, what are the benefits of this model? Um, it's very multidimensional. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of metadata that we're collecting. And the real the real question is, you know, what job versions, uh, well, you know, one or more produced and consumed uh, data set version X. Right. So what that means is, um, when, when this this question it becomes really important when you first when you deploy a pipeline. So whether it's the first version or you're maintaining it and creating new uh, new versions of that pipeline because you're modifying code. Um, when you deploy that pipeline, you don't really know what where the issues are until maybe a week later. Um, so someone's going to report that oh their dashboard seems off. It's like oh maybe maybe it's correct, maybe it's not, and you start looking at trends, and it definitely doesn't look correct. So trying to pinpoint when that issue first was introduced, and also what are the uh, what are the data sets or the the um, the pipelines that are now affected downstream of that data quality issue is a very tough. Uh, question to answer. And what, we, what we're looking to do with the Marquez model is make that question a lot easier to answer. And what that enables you to do is once you're able to identify upstream of, of the dashboard where the, um, where the data quality issue was introduced, you'll then be able to do backfills. So from the origin of where that, maybe it's the code um, that introduced a bug, anything downstream, you'll then be able to kick off a backfill. So you could do full or, or incremental processing and what that means is you could um, you could backfill partitions, right? So normally when you when you store data, you partition it by day. As an example, um, either you could do you could process all the data, uh, all the partitions of that of that of that data set, or you could do partial uh, or in this case incremental uh, processing where 
you only backfill a couple days uh, because those were the only ones that were affected. All right, so how, how does this look like in airflow? So what we're gonna be talking about next is really how the, the integration that we have with Airflow allows you to answer these type of questions, but also um, what type of metadata we're collecting when a DAG executes. Um, and in this case, using op the open lineage uh, uh, standard. So the, the support that Marcus has for Airflow can be broken up into three parts. Um, one is gonna be the metadata that we're collecting uh, around a task. So when a DAG executes, it's gonna have one or more tasks. And the, the integration uh, with Airflow collects the task lifecycle. So when it started, when it ended, so, and also possibly when it fails, so all the different uh, task states. We also collected task parameters. So what was passed into the task um, could be some Booleans that maybe trigger a certain part of the code or disables it. You probably wanna know that while you're debugging a problem. And then same thing with the, um, the source code, uh, kind of what we talked about where, uh, where that's used for the versioning logic. So when a task runs, we also, if you've enabled um, git syncs, so if you're pulling your code from GitHub, and in this case, your DAGs from GitHub, um, the integration will automatically build that git link to that git, to the git SHA and make it e a lot easier to know what was the code that executed at a given time when, that, when a certain data set was produced or modified in some way. At the same time, we're also going to capture all the inputs and outputs. So the inputs and outputs, uh, for example, could be a SQL statement. So what are your input tables? And also, what is the table that you're writing to? And the second part is, uh, in terms of the, the, the type of information that we're extracting, is the, the lineage graph. So this, as your DAG runs, uh, normally in the Airflow UI, you have a single view of the DAG. And as we kind of talked about before, Marquez keeps track of all the different jobs and their inputs and outputs and stitches together the graph for you uh, behind the scenes. So what we're able to do now is understand what DAGs depend on each other. So really interdag dependency would become super important. Some people, I'm sorry, some teams within an organization have a single DAG that works, um, but while others, they have it where they modify the airflow code in some way that allows them to know what are the dependencies within uh, within the DAGs themselves. I'm sorry, uh, across DAGs. The integration also uh, comes with some built-in support for SQL parser. And I think uh, with Airflow, it's a very common use case to use SQL to process data. Um, so we have a built-in SQL parser that supports um, a few dialects as, um, of, uh, of SQL. Um, the one that we're testing with is Redshift and Postgres, but MySQL is also supported. Um, and of course, that link to code, so it builds it builds the GitHub link. Um, we're also working on GitLab, but at the same time, we're also working on extending the open lineage standard to support how do you build that link in a generic way that it, we don't we don't have specific for code for GitHub or or GitLab. And the other one, um, the the other thing that comes built in is the um, metadata extractors, which we'll go into deeper into in the next slide. But this is how we begin to extract metadata around the tasks uh, that are, are, are part of a DAG. So at a really high level, you have a DAG that executes an airflow using the Marquez um, library that emits open lineage events to the lineage endpoint. And then behind the scenes, Marquez takes, uh, takes care of the versioning for you um, keep, uh, keeping track of the inputs and outputs for a run, um, register sources, and at the same time, if the data set in some way has changed within the context of a run, it will then version that for you as well. So this has this has ma massive benefits. So if you're, um, you know, as your as your organization is growing, and more and more teams um, rely on data. Um, to do some some sort of uh, calculation, whether it's going to understand like, you know, what are the trends? Like if, for example, if you, uh, if you have a, uh, I mean, I use food delivery um, quite a bit as an example, but uh, so say you have a food delivery website and you want to know, you know, over time, what are the trends and orders? Um, you'll be able to quickly identify if there was a, 
if there was an issue in your data where that where that uh, where that issue started. So what does the integration look like um, in code? And so for or number one, it's this is open source and a lot of um, I mean the Marquez code base is open source and a lot of what we've been talking about is open source. Um, and what this ends up doing, it enables global task level metadata collections. So if you look, you'll see what's highlighted is Marquez underscore Airflow. So normally you'd have from Airflow import DAG. Now you have, instead of doing that, you 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 uh, modify that and just do from Marquez underscore Airflow import DAG. Uh, so what behind the scenes, what we do is we extend the DAG class. Uh, so we don't do anything. Um, uh, we don't introduce code that could break your, your DAG. I think that's pretty important. All we do is wrap it. And if there are any exceptions, we do swallow it and log it. Um, so it, it's a matter of just when the DAG executes, we, we traverse through the different tasks that are within the DAG. And as the task, uh, as, as, as we interact with a task, we then know what extractor to apply in order to uh, collect metadata and eventually send it to the Marquez backend. What I mean by that is, for every operator, so in Airflow, you have various operators. And in this example, we have Post, uh, Postgres as an operator. And you know, for every operator, it maps to an extractor in, in, the, uh, in the Marquez Airflow library. So a Postgres operator will have a Postgres extractor. And that knows how to, one, parse the SQL, two, um, fetch the schema for both, uh, uh, for the input and output data sets and really bundle that up in a way so that way the job metadata and the data set metadata is then registered in the Marquez backend. So that's done automatically for you. Um, it's just a matter of just modifying the, uh, doing a one line change within your DAG to get a lot of stuff for free. So if we walk through the different phases uh, um, of operator metadata extraction. So here we have a new room booking DAG uh, dot pi with one task and that task is just going to, it's got a task ID called new room booking. It's got a connection called an analytics DB um, and, and also a really simple SQL statement. So the first thing that's gonna happen is we need to know the source. So we need to extract um, the source uh, connection ID and register that and, or in, in this case, bundle it in, in the payload that it would be eventually send it to the Marquez backend. So we observe that, okay, analytics DB is going to be our source. The data sets themselves, we only have one, we're just doing an insert. So the output data set is room bookings. And the job, we're going to call it new room bookings. Now there's a certain format that we do have um, that we, when we register the, the job, uh, in this case, the task to, and map it to a job on the Marquez backend. Uh, so what the notation that we use is, you have the DAG ID dot the task name. Right, so in this case, um, the DAG could be called, uh, let's call it like room bookings or some general name like that, and it'd be dot new room bookings. Right. So the next thing is, you know, what what does this give us? So you could have, you could imagine you have two DAGs running and they don't know anything about each other, but they somehow depend on each other. And the way they depend on each other is through a room bookings table. Uh, so you don't really, without the integration, you might have to reach out to someone. You might have to either uh, look at the DAG code directly. But if you enable the um, the metadata extraction with open lineage, you're able to view that within the lineage graph that Marquez builds on the back end and maintains. And then you could eventually explore through the UI. All right, so next I'm gonna run through a quick demo. Um, so I've already set up Airflow. So I have Airflow running locally. I have Marquez as well running locally. And what we have here is we have um, a food delivery example. So you have ETL jobs on deliveries um, in the past seven days, our customers, our, our categories, um, maybe some discounts that we've applied. So we've emailed customers because they had a poor experience and we wanna give them a discount. We have, a, we have a, 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 an Airflow DAG for that. But the one we're going to look at is ETL deliveries seven days. So what this does is aggregates all the deliveries in the past week. Um, and if you look at the task that it has, uh, there's a wait. So it does rely um, on a, a table upstream or a job to complete upstream. 
and also it looks like it creates, so if not exists, uh, is a task that will be uh, executed if a table doesn't exist, and then it finally does an insert. All right, so to better understand, uh, let me show you here, the graph view. So I think to better understand what this DAG is doing, we can look at the source code. Um, but first I'm gonna point out that the import's different. So like I mentioned, instead of Airflow import DAG, you're doing Marquez underscore Airflow import DAG. Um, the DAG itself is called delivery time seven days. And here are the different tasks. So in this case, it's waiting for an e it's waiting for ETL delivery seven days. So that's an upstream external DAG. And we're just uh, rescheduling. So if for some reason, it, the condition hasn't been met, we reschedule it. And uh, we have, if not exists, so like we, like we thought, so here are the top delivery times. So it's going, when, this, uh, when this runs, it's going to see if this table exists. If not, it will create it because we're going to be using it in our insert, uh, insert task. So here you can see we're inserting top delivery times into a top delivery times table. So we do some calculation here and we query the uh, delivery seven days table and we then do uh, order by delivery time. So since all these DAGs have executed, uh, all right, they've all successfully completed, we could then go into the Marquez UI. Now there's a, there's a few things going on here. Like I mentioned, there's a search component. Um, and also, so if you wanted to search for a particular job or data set, you'd be able to do that. But in our case, we have the complete lineage graph of the DAGs that have executed. Um, so for us, we were interested in delivery days, there we go, delivery time seven days, and we were doing an insert. And one of the things that are collected when a DAG executes is going to be the SQL statement itself. So not only are we registering uh, job metadata with a namespace, which gives you this ownership concept, we are, we are also collecting um, a few things about the job itself. And one of those is if it's an ETL job and it's SQL based, where we're collecting the SQL. Right, so we, we display that in the UI. And if we take a quick look um, at the upstream job, so here you can see that there's a, uh, it has delivery time seven days as input. So if you look at the parsing, you can see that it's doing a select on se a delivery seven days. I'm sorry, let me smooth this out. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, the DAG was called delivery time seven days. And what we do is we use a, a, a dot delimiter and then we, um, uh, use the task name. So it's always the DAG ID dot the task ID. And that's just a convention that we decided on uh, when we when we collect a lineage metadata from uh, from DAGs. Now, finally, if we go upstream, you'll see this is a bit more complex as SQL. It's doing a few inner joins on order status, customer, restaurants, drivers, and so forth. And eventually it starts into delivery time seven days. So if I zoom out, so if I go back here, and I do, I do a zoom out, you'll see order status, restaurants. So that's, so if I click on order seven days, you'll see, you'll be able to highlight the different um, columns, but also their types. So this actually was, when a DAG executes, this was extracted for you. So there's no extra steps that you have to do as long as the integration has um, the source ID or the connection ID, it's able to then query and fetch the schema. Um, so the one, the next thing I wanted to show you is how this graph is displayed. So you don't have to go directly through the UI. You do have the option to use the REST API directly. So if I go to the lineage graph here, uh, you'll see that the, the graph, the REST API, when you do a call, it returns back a graph, a flattened graph of, of array of nodes within an outages. And there's a data associated with the node and there's different types and so forth. But what I wanted to do I scroll through really quick. Uh, what I wanted to do is an example REST call. So here I'm going to do, uh, so I have data, can, I'm sorry, um, Marquez running locally and the, the UI. And what I'm going to do is just hit the REST API directly. So here we have API v1 uh, beta. So the lineage API was recently transitioned into a top level API. So it's out of beta. Uh, so if you wanted to use that, it, you totally can. I'm just going to use the beta endpoint because it's backwards compatible. So we're not getting rid of that endpoint um, anytime soon. And what you want to do is uh, you want to provide a node ID. 
And also the node ID itself has a particular format. So it's usually, it's gonna be, there's a node type. So you have the, it's either a job or a data set. You're gonna have the namespace, which is going to be food deliveries. And then you're gonna have the name of the job itself. So here we were, we were looking at ETL deliveries seven days. And it's gonna be delimited by, uh, by a colon. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the API column and you'll see what's printed out. So I'm not gonna go through all the nodes, but what's returned is a, uh, like we saw in the open API spec. Uh, it's going to be a graph with an array of, of, uh, of nodes. So here you'll see the ID. In this case, since it's reachable, so the, the entire graph is reachable, um, you could filter, you could actually make it where you don't return back a bunch of nodes. So, so you, could, you could do a limit of one or two. But here I just return back all the nodes that are reachable from that node uh, upstream and, and downstream. Uh, so here we have a job called orders popular day of week. Uh, and the node type is job. And then when you look at the data, depending on the type of node, whether it's a data set or a job, um, it's gonna display different uh, type, uh, different node data. So here you have the type batch. So this is going to be a batch job. There, there are streaming jobs as well. You're gonna have the ID. So the ID itself is really the unique identifier of the job. Uh, recently, we we exposed a job version API. So the, when you return, when you fetch a job version, it will have namespace, name, and version. Uh, so if you want, go check that out. Uh, but this is just rep this represents just the current state of the job itself. Uh, you have the job name, when it was updated and created, also the namespace, the inputs and outputs. And I think this is the this is also an important part. Um, the inputs and output data sets that are associated with the job are data set IDs. And again, that's a unique way to identify data sets. And you'll have the SQL. So this is the SQL that's displayed uh, in the UI. And as well as the, in this case, doesn't have a description, but there is a latest run. So if you remember from the slide that has the had Marquez's core model, every run is based off a job version. So this doesn't expose the job version in the graph itself, but this is just saying, here's the latest run for this job. Um, what, was its, what was its state? When did it end? Um, did it complete? Uh, what was the duration? And also what were the run arcs as well? Um, and in this case, the SQL. Again. And the most important part is going to be, what are the in and out edges? So the node, uh, the graph node will have, the, uh, I mentioned before, an ID, a type, data, but then also where can I go from here? So what were the in edges and what were the out edges? So it always, there's uh, two fields that has the origin. So the in edge, what was the, the starting? Origin also where's the destination. So in this case, this job has a data set as an input, and you'll see it has a, it's a, the data the data set the input data set is called public dot top delivery times, and the destination is going to be uh, the job itself. So in this case, the orders are a popular day of week, and then it's also for this job, it's going to write to uh, uh, to a table. All right, so in this case, it's going to write to Orders popular day uh, day of week. All right, so if I go back and I look at the job, to really the graph form in this case just the UI so that we can see on how all this is stitched together. Uh, you'll have the job which has one out one output, popular orders day of week, and similar you'll have the input which is top delivery times. Okay. So yeah, that was the demo, and also that was that was our talk. So in this case, um, I wanted to make sure that if you had any questions or you wanted to learn more about Open Lineage and Marquez, here are some great links. So check us out on GitHub.com Open Lineage, or for Marquez, GitHub.com Marquez Project, and we have a Slack channel as well as a Twitter account. And yeah, that's all. That's all I had. Mm -hmm.